Uh, so before I get going, I just want to thank Nathan and Petar for having me here. It's fucking incredible <laughs> to, to be in Dubrovnik. Um, beautiful. And uh, this paper has its origins in a paper about the third the size that I presented in Toronto recently. So if it seems like it's expanded or bulging at certain um, junctures, it is. And you're right. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to jump right in. Is the title? No. <laughs> um, so the title is Denial of Access, the Black Screen is Cinematic Limit. In the English translation of the script for Guy Debord's 1952 film Howl's Facade by Ken Nab, the descriptions on the right hand of the page read as follows. Silence for one minute during which the screen remains dark. Silence for 30 seconds, during which the screen remains dark. Silence for five minutes, during which the screen remains dark. During which the screen remains dark. There are two salient components at work here in these instructions. The first is the subordination to silence the dark screen is subjected to. As viewers of the film know, the film marries dialogue with the white screen and silence with the black screen, alternating the two at varying intervals. The distribution of the two begins inequitably, and as the film proceeds, so the gap widens. The total runtime of Howl's Versailles is 64 minutes, but 40 of those are made up of nothing but the empty black screen and silence. But in this formulation, it is the silence which is for a given duration, and it is this duration which the black screen and its inherent darkness is parasitic upon. The screen remains dark only during the period in which there is silence. The primacy lent to silence here, I would argue, speaks to something I'll be returning to again and again in this paper, that the black screen can be conceived of as an image of the cinematic lower limit, and therefore that anything at all which would be remarked upon, instructed, or directed including the absence of sound, demands attention prior to the establishing of the black screen. And this is sort of why a lot of like screenplay formations, um, specifically in transitions like fade in and fade out, have an unspoken um, from and to black that's implied. This brings us to the other component which I want to extract from this formulation. That relationship which is produced with the usage of the verb remains in relation to the screen and to dark. When we consider that which remains, it denotes something which was already there, something which remains is not in the business of appearing so much as retaining its presence. This claim then becomes generative, at least within the, uh, at least within the reading I'm regarding as tenable, at the point of the implicit presence which precedes the verb's activation, that the screen is always already dark, the black screen is ever present and so can remain black, even while something is seemingly antithetical to it as the white screen is being projected. This is all to say that the black screen's presence is implicated in and operative on all filmic imagery as something which will be retained should any of that imagery be displaced. This articulation of De Bord's makes up a concise and precise indication of what I perceive to be its status as an underpinning, an implicit ground for the cinematic. This function as grounding is held in tension with its value as an agent of interruption, an image which interrupts. And it is this dynamic that allows for what I'm calling the figuration of the black screen as a cinematic limit, both as that which allows for the cinematic to be constituted and that which represents a nearest proximity to a cinematic negation as is possible, i.e. an image which pushes this particular mode of representation to its closest relation to a cinematic non-being, the only image which can trouble the viewer's stable notions of the finitude of the cinematic. Before I go any further, I want to address something which I think is crucial in considerations of the sort I'm about to make, and which points out a serious attitudinal deficiency in current discourse around the abstract qualities of blackness in the realm of the aesthetic. This deficiency is brought about by the attempted decoupling of these notions of blackness from the material history of racialization, and it is the intellectual labor that exhibits itself as an exhaustion of the material at hand which I seek to avoid, because it inadvertently competes with something like Frank Wilderson's analysis of structural antagonisms related to the constitution of blackness and whiteness. So my point is not that it's irresponsible to discuss blackness in an aesthetic sense, but that doing so without attending to the fraught relationship between this abstract 
concept and the construction of blackness via racialization, especially given that abstract notions of blackness as tied to value judgments have a long and brutal history of being mobilized against black communities, is a negligent act. The point is to pull back from adopting an attitude of foreclosure, of or exhaustion, and so at least promote the necessity of these interventions, as opposed to attempting to provide them in some sort of uh, liberal or paternalistic way. So while my work in this section of the paper is aimed at situating relationally the concept I'm discussing, what it is not is a serious or prolonged intervention into the history of conceptual deployment of blackness. In the face of the crushing weight of late modernity's anti-black logic, my project absolutely requires the foregrounding of our attention to the proximity between something like the black screen's aesthetic similarity to the monolithic black painting and the monolithic black painting's indebtedness to the racist antagonism, which produced things as abhorrent as the black paintings of uh, Paul Bilho and uh, Alphonse Allais, for instance. But what I would argue that I am incapable of supplying from my particular subject position is an account of the movement between the abstract quality of blackness and the blackness of racialization, which is adequate to that problem. I think these um, accounts can be provided, obviously, by people who are more attuned uh, from their subject position to you know, producing uh, adequate accounts which can incorporate experience, which I absolutely cannot. Um, Claudia Rankine hints at the deficiency here when she opens her 2014 book, Citizen, an American Lyric, with an epigraph from Chris Marker's Sans Soleil. She quotes, if they don't see happiness in the picture, at least they'll see the black. The full quotation which opens the film is the following. The first image he told me about was of three children on a road in Iceland in 1965. He said that for him, it was the image of happiness, and also that he had tried to link it to other images, but it never worked. He wrote me one day, I'll have to put it at the beginning of a film with a long piece of black leader. If they don't see happiness in the picture, at least they'll see the black. Rankine highlights through excision the sort of myopia inherent in forming this image of happiness in the form of three smiling white children in relation to this abstract blackness provided by black leader. So responding to this framework, what I want to do is discuss and analyze the operations of the cinematic black screen and its peculiar relationship with the spectator while refraining from any claims of like authoritative foreclosure, rather than explicating the cohesive totality of the black screen and exhausting its relations, the aim is to offer a few observations situated along the trajectory of the black screen's history and simply attempt to ascertain their tenability. The correction at work here is to avoid assigning value judgments to blackness and to discuss its operational effects in this specific cinematic context and with relation to the black screen instead. So moving on. Terminologically, it is decisive that the black screen remains thought of as an image. Perhaps we can take Fred Kellerman, director of photography for Bellatar's films Journey on the Plain, The Man from London, and The Turn Horse at his word when he says, and I quote, even a black screen is an image. But if we do not, we can find support in the very positionality within which we encounter the black screen. We encounter it within the runtime of a film, definitively contextualized as a part of a series, embedded within the temporal flow unified by duration. The black screen is not reducible to the actual absence of light on the screen. It is the screen's darkness which precedes and succeeds the movie's projection slash displaying, which in my reading, the black screen is an image of. In the assigned opposition of the darkened movie theater or room, which is normatively positioned as a point of reference from which deviations are measured, the environment going dark is both a precondition for the cinema and the negation of it as such. This is why the position of the black screen is so precarious. It's an image of the very thing which spectators are conditioned to expect before and after a movie, but not during. Um, so I'd like to take note of another feature of the black screen which locates it in its precarity. It's visual indiscernibility. It is the indiscernibility of the image of the black screen which exacerbates its precarity. If we have the set of normative viewing conditions, be they ideal or not, in particular that of the darkened room, the black screen is a challenge to our spectatorship in that it colludes with the environment to destabilize the delimitation of the frame. Now this is something that absolutely would not be operative in like a room like this if I were projecting things because it's, there's too much light, but what I'm talking about is sort of like a latent capacity and that that informs our knowledge and experience of the cinematic because we go into a film having seen other films and sort of knowing the, the logic by which these films are produced. Um, 
So if the room is black and the screen is black, it becomes harder to perceive where the screen ends and the environment begins. Of course, this is not the case in all circumstances, but its capacity to do so in this given context, and this given context is a major one, illustrates this precarious notion of imageness, which spectators could not be faulted for not identifying. Beyond this problem of delimitation, which may or may not be present, the most prominent feature of the black screen's indiscernibility is its appearance of imagelessness. And this is something that comes up again and again in commentators on uh, Debord's film, and even Debord himself will say that it is a film without images. This appearance of imagelessness is why the black screen is so robust an image for me and so robust a topic. Its perception as not what it is, its capacity to be mistaken for those conditions which extend beyond the cinematic into the realm of the contextual environment. This confusion of delimitation figures as a kind of contrary uh, struggle. A person's struggle to decipher the imagehood of an image their inability to identify the black screen as an image is kept alive in a certain capacity of the black screen um, in which deployments foreground its approximation of cinematic negation. Um, so I'm going to map out some of the applications and attributes the black screen has, the generative usages it's been put to, and some of the readings which emerge as potentialities during a critical appraisal of the black screen as image. To accomplish this, I'm going to analyze four instances of the black screen and highlight the qualities they illustrate. The first example, which I'll uh, consider, is an early scene from Charlie Chaplin's 1936 masterpiece, Modern Times. The setting is the office of the president of Electro Steel Corp, and it's the scene which introduces us to the president and the workplace he supervises. Positioned behind him, the wall is inset with a mammoth black screen humming with electricity. In the foreground, the president simply sits at his desk, going about his daily routine. He fiddles with his puzzle, reads the newspaper, is given, and then takes his medication, all before he finally gets around to surveilling his workforce. He flips a switch on the control console on his desk, the noise reaches a higher pitch, and the screen comes to life. The basic model is that of an early television, um, complete with remote control. He uses the switches on his desk to cycle through a variety of cameras placed throughout the factory. But then the reverse shot ruptures this assumption, because it illustrates that this is not a simple television, but it's also a transmission device. From a worker's point of view, we see the watchful glare of the president as he surveys his employees and instructs him uh, to increase productivity. So the figure of the black screen in this moment goes unremarked upon. It's simply present to act as transition between the surveillance angles and as a constituent element which the functioning screen's positive content displaces. 13 minutes and 40 seconds later, however, the scenario changes. The next scene I'm taking up, and uh, four screen caps extracted from it are included on the handout I gave you as figure one. Um, and it runs from about 16 minutes, 42 seconds, to 17 minutes, 23 seconds. Uh, Chaplin's factory worker, already disoriented from his exposure to an experimental machine designed to allow employees to continue to work while eating, is fed into the iconic assembly line's comical inner workings. This is perhaps the iconic image of the film. Um, and it's the one that's sort of seen as a stand-in for the movie as a whole. You know, Chaplin is lodged here in between a series of conveniently placed gears with just enough room for a human to slide through. <coughs> the machinery is reversed, and Chaplin is sort of birthed back out of the mechanism, his disorientation reaching new heights. And so he goes about euphorically applying his workplace knowledge, mostly appearing as an exertion of frenetic muscle memory to anything and everything he catches sight of, uh, from buttons to noses to nipples, et cetera, et cetera. Returning to the location of the early workers' surveillance, Chaplin pulls on just about every lever he can find, dancing around the room as the other worker attempts to reverse the damage he's doing. Fire explodes from off screen, Chaplin oils the other worker's eyes, and mayhem ensues. There's another cut back to the president's office, and here's where the figure uh, figures in. And we find him again at his desk, struggling with his remote. In the background, the black screen is now being juxtaposed against the white screen at a frantic interval. The white screen representative of the malfunctioning of the apparatus, it's disobeying despite its operation, while well, the black screen remains coded as the apparatus at rest. Uh, so jumping ahead 24 years, we can see what happens when we subtract the president, the device, the factory worker, the entire narrative framework which has embedded the black screen within it for us to encounter in such a manner. 
The next film, a 1960 experimental short with a runtime of 6 minutes and 44 seconds, is Peter Kabelka's Arnulf Rainer. Ingrid Stig's daughter reports both Stan Brackage and Jonas Mikas as having said that it is, quote, a film experience that cannot be switched off by the closing of the eyes, unquote. The film's aesthetic content is almost an exact replica of that of the screen in the president's office in modern times. A rapid alternation of the black and white screens, though it also inherits the silence black sound white pairings that were present in Howl's Facade. It is worth noting that if you excise the title card, a cut between the office in modern times and the six minutes plus of epileptogenic experimentation that is Arnold Rainer is not only tenable, but actually follows a logical shot progression. It's simply perceived as a close-up. Um, so this quote about the film being indifferent to the closing of the eyes is an interesting one, because I think it serves to illustrate how minuscule the thread, and to some spectators' considerations how negligible the thread, is between the image of the black screen and its referent, the absolute blackness implicit as the non-being of the cinematic. It is precisely this thin line between closing our eyes and remaining open to the encounter which demarcates the limit of the cinematic. The black screen is never exhausting this negation and can only really gesture towards it. This is why black screens can always be compared and contrasted over different mediums, modes of representation, through compression artifacts, watermarks, and uneven distribution of uh, accidental light, because the referent remains intact. So the black screen represents this cinematic limit against which the instantiations of the cinematic pattern can be measured against. This conception of the black screen as a site for intermedial comparison is actually why I uh, initially found it to be such a robust and dynamic topic for discussion, because it is both absolutely recognizable in its typology and in its unique tokenization. And if I were doing a slideshow, I would then have like nine different uh, screen caps of you know compression wrought black screens. But I'm not, so. Interestingly enough, Kabelka went on to create a counterpart to Arnulf Rainier 52 years later, entitled Antiphone, consisting of an inversion of the patterns that make up the previous film. The black screen becomes the white screen, and the audible becomes the inaudible. It was designed to play on a second projector simultaneously with Arnold Rainer so that the combinatory effect would be a consistent white screen with an accompanying steady stream of white noise. This relationship between the two furthers our understanding of the black screen as one which is necessarily latent to other images in that its impact is nearly negligible when it is subjected to simultaneous projection. Um, and this is an obvious point, but it's impossible to create a steady stream of black screen under the same formal circumstances simply because the white screen is deployed as surplus while the black screen as lack. The character of this absence is such that it is almost imperceptible, yet it is very much still active in our mode of spectatorship, so that though a white screen may obliterate its perceptual value for the duration of a shot, the white screen's removal allows for a potential retention. That is to say that there is always the capacity for the screen to remain dark. Knowing that the two screens can be laid over top of each other to produce an apparent unbroken and continuous projection, we can consider something elemental to the empty screen's makeup, given its relation to the plethora of images which do seek to fill the frame. Laura Mulvey speaks to this in Death 24 Times a Second when she discusses the ending of Perot Le Fou, that last glimpse of empty blue sky. And here she's talking about a blue screen, but I think that there's like a, this sort of relationship between the blue screen's uh, unvaried visual field and the black screen's unvaried visual field, which actually pushes the black screen closer in proximity to what she talks about as the stasis at the end. Um, so the blank screen, simultaneously something and nothing, creates an ending that is purely cinematic, one that can only be given by cinema. The abstraction of pure light merges with the whiteness of the screen. The empty screen duplicates the still frame illuminated by the projector's beam creating a return to the stasis of the end that is derived from the cinema itself. This seeks to characterize only the empty frame which fills the white screen with an abstraction of pure light, specifically in its connection to stasis via its unvaried visual field. Variance in the visual field is one of the constituent working elements which produces movement in cinema, the careful relation of similarity and difference being calculated to impose continuity on the unsuspecting frames via their rapid mediation by the cinematic apparatus, and in turn by perception and the inherent optical limits to perception which prevent apprehension of more than 12 frames per second as distinct. 
So thus far, I've really just outlined a few different moments or events in the so-called life of the black screen as it emerges and re-emerges in contexts where it draws attention to itself, where the spectator is forced to contend with it not just as a fixture or as a passive element of the apparatus and the projection we're displaying, um, but as held in contradistinction to its perceived opposite, the white screen. Yet as modern time shows, this opposition is not an absolute one, and is simply an assigned bifurcation. Because though the black screen and the white screen are at one point contrasted, earlier in the film the black screen is shown with and in relation to the various footage of the warehouse. So the idea is that the multitude of kind of positive contents that are being cycled through um, the surveillance equipment is, uh, is still positioned against the black screen as the white screen will later be. So the shock of being forced to focus attention on the black screen, something which provides a foundation for the cinematic to operate upon, but is not regularly rendered explicit or exhibited as an image as such, explains why the May 1960 premiere of Arnold Rainer opened with a theater full of 300 people and closed a little less than seven minutes later with a scant dozen still in their seats. Kabelka comments, I lost most of my friends because of Arnold Rainer. <laughs> this can be seen as an echo of the premiere of Debord's Howl's Facade eight years earlier when, on June 30th, 1952, that film was stopped <laughs> after less than 10 minutes due to what was perceived as its egregious lack of content. Debord's 1959 collab... <laughs> Great, <thanks. laughs> um, Thank you. Debord's 1959 collaboration with Asger Jorn, the book Memoirs, includes a couple of pages dedicated to the reception of Hal's Rasad with lines like, the audience were offended and screamed madly, and we could hear the shrill cries of women and the slanders of men. <laughs> This leads up to the appropriation of a Maurice Henri, uh, or Henry, I'm actually not sure, um, cartoon featuring a presenter gesturing towards the screen and recaption to read, Film Club, you are attending the screening of the first flop. There are two relevant little details of this cartoon. First is that the theater is still full, and second is that the screen is a white one. So the common thread here is that when a film takes as its subject or by its content produces an acknowledgement of the very framework upon which cinema depends but which the cinema is irreducible to, the audience can feel their expectations as having been violated. The audience responds to both Howell's facade and Arnold Rainier presents a conflicting picture of the relationship between the cinematic, the believability of the image, and so the suppression of the acknowledgement of the image as such, and the spectator's interest. The discomfort produced by the frenetic, effective experience of Arnold Rainier and the manipulation of confusion present in Hal's facade serves to situate the effects which are produced by the recognition of the black screen as image and therefore as embedded in the cinematic relationship. We sit with the black screen in a situation designed to call its imagehood to our mind, that of the frenetic or slow alternation with the white screen, and its inability to cohere with what we expect of an image. And this collision prompts us to refuse it as a cinematic encounter. We reject it, and in so doing, illustrate another kind of cinematic limit which the black screen can function as, that of the limit to the audience's patience. Moving beyond these expressions of the black screen, which call attention to themselves and exert a defamiliarizing uh, de menace, my next example is indicative of how the black screen functions on a less conspicuous register. The example is drawn from a scene in Chantal Ackerman's phenomenal News From Home. Um, and this is figure two, by the way. Um, so the film consists of Ackerman reading her mother's letters from Belgium as footage is shown from various locations around New York City. The letters range from the weaponization of guilt to the imparting of regular maternal advice. Wear a jacket when it's cold. I sent you $20. Did you receive it? Um, have the boxes arrived, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. So the, the scene I'm referring to runs from about an hour seven minutes into the movie through an hour 11, and it takes place in the interior of a subway train. The audio, it, though recorded separately and unsynced, is mostly background noise from the train, and a single letter is read from Ackerman's mother. But within this context, within this disjointed comparison between the alienation of cities and the interstitiality of being on the move, the film capitalizes on the black screen's familiarity and accompanying invisibility as an image. And in this, we have to keep in mind the myriad of commentators on board uh, referring to Howell's facade as being without images. 
in a way which illustrates something I'm going to call its abyssal quality. The two compartments of the subway pictured are well lit and populated. And I know it doesn't necessarily seem like that on the um, figures, but it's just because it's not a black and white movie and it's a little darker. Um, but you still get the idea. So the camera is fixed at a little below eye level and it's a standard full unbroken shot with the back compartment visible only through the open threshold perfectly centered in the frame. Unbroken, that is, until the following sequence of events. The back compartment goes black, then is relit. The front compartment goes black, leaving the only light those which are illuminating the back compartment. Both lights relight, a few seconds elapse, and the back compartment goes black again, the pattern implying that the light will return and the front compartment will go black, but instead the black screen intrudes. The entire screen is filled with black for a duration of about six frames, a quarter of a second before the shot returns. So looking at that figure, I've crudely laid out four representative moments of this scene, and it is in the differences between the first couple of frames, taken two seconds apart, and the final frame that I call your attention to. Interrupted by the black screen, we have a radical reconfiguration of bodies and objects. This occurs in less than a second of runtime. The man with the bucket hat is now gripping the handle above his head, a bag has been moved on the floor, a packaged bouquet of flowers becomes prominent, and in the back compartment, one man disappears while another appears. Though the empirical runtime, the duration of the film has steadily progressed and been presented to us as an unbroken shot, the jarring juxtaposition, I point out, is made possible because of the inclusion of two distinct temporalities. And this is actually where um, Petar kind of saved my life with that Modern Times book, because it specifically addresses what I'm talking about. Um, so to quote from the last essay in the handy and fortuitously offered book, <laughs> uh, Cinema is not a language designed to provide information about a reality existing outside it. The words of this language are realities themselves. They are moments, movements, gestures borrowed from everyday life and work. And communicating does not mean informing, it means linking. As for cinema, it means movement. Cinematic communication thus consists in constructing the global movement within which all the movements are linked together. And a little further down the same page, it's 141. Um, it is a way of bringing times closer, to put a multiplicity of temporalities into a unique temporal flow. In an earlier book, Rancière identifies the camera as foundationally a transmitter of movement, and this is uh, Intervals of Cinema from 2014. And it is here that we can see that the identification of a cinematic temporality is dependent on this transmission of movement for its specificity. And this is why the black screen poses such a unique solution to the problem Ackerman works through in this scene. Because the black screen is as proximate to the immobile as the film it can approximate, the variation between frames being minimal, though it be bound and interpreted by the materiality of the filmmaking process, hairs in the gate, scratches, dead pixels, compression, etc., it is fundamentally an image of stasis. And here we can keep in mind Mulvey's claim about empty screens recalling the stasis of the end. Because it is not purely static, it is not reducible to simply closing our eyes, but because it is an image of stasis, it constructs a zone of indiscernibility. It prevents us from orienting ourselves both spatially through a lack of illumination and temporally through a lack of variance, the requisite condition for movement. This makes for a unique temporality which is measurable only by what it devours, and thus we can return to the Ackerman excerpt with an eye for the abyssal, devouring dimension of the black screen. The screen is black for six frames. Yet all of those movements, those coordinations, those adjustments, they would account for much more than that. If the shot were unbroken, we would witness the front compartments going black for somewhere between six and 24 frames, the light would return, and we would witness the gestures and processes by which the people and objects in the frame move. Maybe not entirely, but we'd get more of a sense of like, how they reconfigured. This is not what occurs. Instead, the black screen innocuously and constructively deploy is deployed in those six frames, and so it constructs a temporality capable of absorbing what would amount to, and this is just an estimate, five times that quantity of frames were unfolding in the same time frame as the subway car, hence abyssal. That the black screen has its own temporality, and that this temporality is inaccessible to us, and that this inaccessibility can be counted on by filmmakers in order to embed the black screen within their footage speaks to the peculiar position of the black screen as possessing another order of indiscernibility in addition to the previous one, which is generated by the lack of variation within a single frame. 
So what I've tried to grapple with here is the black screen as something which is constitutive of our viewing experience, but which threatens upon examination a kind of obliteration of that experience. While modern times, the movie establishes the black screen as in opposition to not only the white screen, but to every other cinematic image. The other examples from Arno Freyner to Howl's Facade and on into News from Home illustrate the different modalities of filmmaking which can take this image of negation and assign a function to it in relation to the other images it contrasts with. But once the films end and the apparatus's cessation occurs, the referent of the images retain. This is to say that once the other images have been displaced, the screen remains dark. Thank you.